Okay, here we are. Welcome to the after lunch session. Some of you are going to nod off in about 20 minutes. That's inevitable. We'll just have to deal with that. So, I've repositioned Bob and Mai's airplane back on the runway at Payne Field. Here we go. Now, one of the things I skipped up till now, we've kind of pointed to it, is the status bar. This portion across the top of the screen. And just, just to be clear then, we already talked about the timestamp in the middle. We talked about the transponder enunciation there. From there left is the enunciation for the autopilot. The left portion would give you the status of the roll axis for the autopilot. In this case, it's navigating to a GPS signal. And then the right portion is the vertical axis. It's currently functioning in the vertical speed mode with a target altitude of 1,100 feet, at which point it would level off and hold that altitude. So if you looked at this in the pilot user guide, you'd see a, a long chart of all these different enunciations for the autopilot. And if you approached it, do you, how, how many of you remember studying all the various charts for VFR cloud clearances for your pilot? I, yes, I can quote that to you today because I'm an instructor. But we don't remember all that stuff. I can't hardly remember the chart. Same thing with the autopilot enunciations. You could spend lots of time trying to memorize that chart. If you just go out and use it, I think you'll find that they're pretty intuitive and you'll, you'll quickly become accustomed to what the enunciations mean for the autopilot. Okay, engine start. So now when we get ready to start the engine, I, do I need all this information when I start the engine? Probably not. So let's reconfigure the display. And notice, here's what we see in the engine currently. So we're all gonna reconfigure our display to be a 100% engine page. Now you don't, ah, yep. so he went right to the engine menu. Yeah, yeah. Now we're talking about the screen layout. So you need to get yourself to the screen menu and don't press the engine button. You wanna leave that one on and press the other to turn off. There you go. Okay, so this is a slide that shows an engine page layout. It's pretty close to what you see over here. This is the live display. And if I were to take us out of pause mode, we would see some real engine instruments. So right off the bat, I want you to notice the interplay between the analog and the digital values. What's the digital value of my RPM? Well, that's pretty low. It's 580 RPM. That's a good idling engine, I guess, huh? Oil, oil temperature, it's 80. It's in yellow, so it's not necessarily good to go, but it's better than zero, right? Uh, maybe in this airplane, I don't take off until my oil temperature gets up in the green. I don't know how yours is. By the way, in setup, you define all those ranges for every one of these sensors. Now, we have some preset configurations that, that come in Skyview. And if you have a Rotax engine, if you select Rotax, we pre-configure some of those for you. But it's still your responsibility to verify each one of those. In our airplane, the Sportsman we fly, um, we've redefined the, the RPM zone to reflect bands in which we don't. We prefer not to operate that engine prop combination. Ah, so what do we see here? Digital, the analog yellow matches where the needle's pointed, so that's good to know. But what about this one? This one's in the red. She's, it's because I'm idling so low, but it's in the red. So not only is it red, that red is generally bad, but we flash at you to draw your eye attention to it. So you don't care what the number is, you just know it's in the red, right? Not, you don't need precision, you need to make a good decision now. Now, there's several different ways we alert you to things that are out of the normal. And, and I've just shown you, we color code them, we analog color coding, flashing to draw your eye. Now this message, we've skipped this button through the rest of the day. It, previously it said MSG, message. It's where we deliver system message to you. All of yours, are red and they all say warning because yours are all in demo mode. Don't want you to go stick them under your arm and put them in your airplane. So they're gonna always say warning. Up here, this one's flashing at me. So Bob, press this one. Ah, it says, hey, your oil pressure is low. Yep, we see that. Notice it also says, oh, Sorry. you disappeared it. Yep. Well, that's a teachable moment. What happened? He, he looked at that message, and do you remember how oil pressure was backlit in red? It was what we call an unacknowledged alert. I had never seen that alert before, and that's why the message light was flashing. So I opened it up, and it said, hey, 
oil pressure low. Here's an example where I opened it up and it says backup battery in use, transponder failed. First time I saw those messages, that's why they're backlit. And then I closed the menu and like Bob did, we open it up again. In his case, it wasn't, the message wasn't flashing. In fact, close, close it, Bob. So it's no longer flashing, but it's still red. Something still exists. And when he opens up the menu, they still exist. They're no longer backlit because they are acknowledged alerts. The system knows that I looked at that menu. Now it doesn't know if I understood it. I have a favorite saying, I can explain it to you, but I can't comprehend it for you. So I can't force you to understand what that means, but at least I know you've seen it before. That was a laughable moment, you guys. Come on, let's get some coffee. Same thing here. We, we have a new unacknowledged alert, but the original alerts are still in existence. Why are they yellow? Yellow because they're not as serious, not as critical as red. So how else do we alert? Dine on sky view. There's an audible system, uh, audible alerts as well. On boot up, you just hear that generic message. Dine on sky view. Just to make sure the audible alerts are working. Warning. So that's just a general message. Some, some parameters just give you a general alert. Cylinder head temperature. Some of them are very specific. And so those are warning messages. Approaching altitude. Now that's just what we call an alert message. It's not associated with any warning color. This is specifically related to your altitude with respect to the altitude bug. And by the way, regardless of whether you're using the autopilot, you all saw how we could change the heading bug and the altitude bug, even though the autopilot's not turned on. At that point, they're just visual reminders. In the case of the altitude bug, if you've set it for an altitude different than your own, even without the autopilot engaged, as the aircraft approaches that altitude, you'll hear her say this. Approaching altitude. And then uh, once you've gotten on an altitude, if you depart from that by a certain number of hundred feet, she'll also say, hey, you're not paying attention or whatever she says. Departing altitude. Departing altitude or something like that. Yep. You might be tempted to turn something like that off. You might say, well, geez, you know, when I'm flying circuits in the pattern, she becomes a nuisance. Every time I climb up, up to pattern on the down, downwind, she blurts out at me. I don't want that. So you can go into the system setup and turn off that alert. But what happens when you disable an alert system? and you don't remember to turn it on and next time you nun it, then it's not there for you. For this one in particular, a more rational approach in my job is just spin the heading bug or the altitude bug up out of the way so that you don't, you don't hear it. It's a better use of it. Now you can redefine the proximity to the bug value at which she alerts. I think the default is probably 200 feet away or maybe 300 feet away. You can make that bigger or littler at your discretion. Okay. Now we're getting ready to taxi, so we've got the engine started. Uh, will you get rid of that menu and give me back the primary flight display? And you can all do this with me too. Can you add your PFD back to your display? You might need to get your, find your way to the screen menu if you're not there. Turn on PFD. Did you get back there? You're pretty close, screen menu and then turn on your PFD page. There you go. Oh, when I talked about the status bar enunciation, I skipped the right hand portion here. This is the enunciation reserved for integration with a comm radio. Now, if you have some other types of comms, there's a the old SL SL the new G series and a couple others uh, we can enunciate the frequencies that are in that radio, but, and we can push discrete frequencies out. But if you use our comm radio, then it, it, it works a lot more seamlessly. Now this panel, I should have asked you to come up during one of the breaks. You can come look at these modules. I'll talk about the ones that are in here. This is a picture of the control module from the Dynon comm radio. And I got the slide goes through and shows you what everything is. There's a the volume knob. There's the frequency for the active frequency. And notice this, this is interesting. This is the nature of the frequencies, the tower frequency, ground, ATIS, um, and whatnot. Then there's a standby frequency. 
This is really important. You can attach, you can identify an airport that you want the comm radio to focus in on. And I'll show you how that works in just a moment. By the way, it has the dual watch or monitor standby frequency capability. So if you enable the dual watch mode, you can listen to ATIS on your standby, but any transmission on the active frequency takes precedent. Works very well. Now, the airport ID, if you tell the radio, I want to listen to a certain airport, then notice these buttons here. They become dedicated to the frequencies unique to that airport. And watch has, as Bob does that, Bob, go to the main menu. Now select the map menu, info, and here's where we get the information about various airports. Now this is, uh, there's a whole hierarchy of decision tree about which airport defaults into this window. But for now, I want you to press the nearest list so we get the system thinking about Payne Field, because that's where we're sitting on the runway at Payne Field. Now when we go back to the info, notice that it will default to Payne Field. Okay, so remember these tabs, I didn't talk about these yet. The frequency tab, if you were to click the joystick to the right, you see a list of all the discrete frequencies for Payne Field, and there's a button that says Tune Com. If you highlight any one of those frequencies and press this button, it would populate that frequency into the standby window for the comm radio. And you can do that if you like. But even more importantly, Let's press back. We're at the nearest list. Now I have a button up here that says airport to comm. When Bob presses that button, it populates the airport identifier in the radio and it actually goes in this window here. This one says Salt Lake City. But if you saw it on this panel, it would say Payne Field, PAE right there. Now, what do you think I need to do if I want to access ATIS? I press the ATIS button and actually if uh, Bob does it on his radio here, you press ATIS and see how this frequency changes and there's the identifier. Now when you press the concentric knob straight in, it flops the frequency. So here's ATIS. Now who am I going to talk to next to take off? I'm going to talk to ground. So he's going to press the ground button on his radio and I flop to ground. And when I'm done talking with ground, I know I'm going to talk to the west tower next and that's 13295. In the case where there's two tower frequencies underneath there, uh, I can cycle through those. There's actually the tower one, tower two, and Unicom. So I cycle through by pressing, here I'm pressing this tower button. Right? <coughs> so it's prepared. When, they, when I roll up to the hold short line, then I simply flop. Now the tower's in, and I'm probably going to talk to ATC if I'm going to go on a Departure, so there's my departure frequency. I hope you can imagine how much this adds to the workflow or, or simplifies the workflow, especially in IFR flying. It's a huge deal, huge deal. So in our, again, in our club airplane, we have a, another manufacturer's IFR GPS navigator. It's a GPS nav comm. It's a very good navigator. I never touch the comm in that because in IFR flying, the frequency flow using this module is so much easier. It's a game changer for me, it really is. So we're really proud of the comm radio. Now here's an interesting feature. Remember we, when we were panning using the knob, we would use the center press of the knob to exit from the panning mode. And then if you press the center of the knob again, it would go back to your last pan position. But in this context, in, in certain contexts when you're in the vicinity, in, in, within the range of the chart, pressing the center of the knob will automatically recall the last chart that you viewed. I think once we get rolling, that will appear in that way. Instrument preceder, same thing. If you, if you bring up the instrument chart for the ILS or the GPS approach, you'll see them on there. Uh, we already talked about the map layers for the sectional and uh, high and low IFR charts. Yeah. Okay, so now we're getting ready to taxi. you got to have your engine instruments on. Maybe you want to taxi with your chart up so you don't run off the, on the run runway. If you've got your PFD and engine and chart, you're good to go. But this is, remember, this is part of that cockpit layout in your regular routine. 
how are you going to have your display configured when you get ready to taxi? Okay. It takes Okay. So you reconfigured your screen like you're like you're ready to go taxi. Here's an interesting thing. We're all taught when we start taxiing, you need to check the instruments, right, to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. The DG is DG. The slip skip all goes out when you make a turn. The instruments will respond in the same way. You should do the same check. What I can assure you is it's extremely unlikely that any one of the attitude instruments would fail individually because of the way the sensors inter interact. Now, airspeed might not be working if you have a bad you know, pressure sensor. But if the DG is turning, the slip skid ball is probably going to work. The failure mode is different than analog instruments. And in fact, there really isn't even a meaningful concept of partial panel failure for the UIFR guys. Because it's extraordinarily rare for any individual sensor to fail. So for IFR purposes, you're going to have two displays. You should. So partial panel really means, oh, I'm fine with flight instruments and map or engine on one display, map on the other. If my primary display goes dark, how quickly can I reconfigure the other display to get flight instruments on? Yeah, we already talked about that. Okay, so now we're getting close to taking off. So let's let's uh, reset the screen again. I don't need the chart for this takeoff purpose. So I'm going to have Bob close the chart. You press the close button, exit from that, and I just assume get rid of the map because I want to focus on the flight instruments in a moment. You guys can decide how you want ears to look for takeoff. But I would like to go back now and practice, have you practice setting these, these bug values. So can you, re, do you remember how to set your barrel value, the barometric pressure setting? You're going to have to access it using one of those knobs. So I'd like you to set the barrel at 3012. The real value doesn't matter to me, I just want you to practice setting it. Do you remember how you have to open up this knob to get to the barrel pressure? Click it one direction or the other. There, and now click up to the barrel and rotate the knob and here's your barrel value. I will point out, however, on the primary flight display, we've looked at some of these values like, like heading bug and whatnot. Notice what happens when I change the barrel it becomes backlit and, and more bright. We draw your eye to that item while you're changing it. I make my change and when I'm done it fades back out of prominence. Notice also that the barrel box has a, a white box around it. That's the visual indicator that one of the knobs is assigned to barrel function. And notice if we look at the heading bug value down here, there's no white box because there's there's no knob that is assigned to it. If I reassign this knob to heading, now there's a white box here. There's no white box around the barrel. Does that make sense? Okay. Do you remember how to set the transponder code? I'd like you to find your way to the transponder menu and reset the transponder to the ALT squawk mode, transmit mode, and punch in 1200 as your discrete code. So you'll have to find your way to the main menu if you're not there. I should have snapped my fingers, that's what I'm left out. Back to the main menu, then to the transponder menu. You want to squawk 1200. 1200. You can put in another value if you want practice. You all got that? Okay, okay so now let's practice again. Set your heading bug and altitude bug values. Now all of your practice displays, they're going to actually turn towards that bug. Bob is going to be presetting his here for takeoff at 165 for heading and then 1600 for ALT for altitude. And of course the altitude bug value is at the top of the altimeter. Do you get all those? We're all set? Okay, one last check. You might change your screen layout again and do it, whether you need your nap for takeoff. That's all up to you. So now this next section, I need you absolutely to focus on the big screen because I'm going to take off and remember one of our objectives.
It was for you to understand everything you see on the primary flight display. So we're going to get ready. Before I take off, look at all these obstacles. This is the control tower on Painfield Airport. Red, so it's 100 feet below or higher. There's a bunch of towers out in the distance here. As we take off you'll, and I start to climb, you'll see those towers will transition to be yellow as I get above them. And eventually they'll go away. How does it know? One of us has to add some throttle. Okay, I'll do it. I'm going to sit down for a minute so I can get us in the air. Notice the airspeed's alive over here, 4950. Now we're flying a Cessna 172 here, so we like to get a good nose wheel shimmy going before we rotate. So we'll, we'll get there. Shall I? Oh, look at that traffic symbol. See that yellow ball? Let me pause there. See this guy? That's a traffic indication. Traffic alert. That, hey, you better look. The yellow ball is the code for a threat symbol. He's actually taxiing on the taxiway there at Payne Field. So that was. Nobody goes to standby anymore. Yeah. Bob says that because nobody puts their transponder standby anymore. Actually, at Towered Fields today, generally, they want you to keep your your transponder in the in the transmitting mode even on the ground they, they rely on it more and more now for ground operations so it's not at all surprising to get traffic enunciations on the ground like that okay so we were got, about to rotate I'll see if I can get things stabilized here come on no I don't remember all those okay now you can See the tower starting to transition to yellow because we're more than 100 feet above them. Airspeed tape over here. This is a good point for me to caution all of you that are leery about tapes versus dial presentations. This is still an analog indicator. It's no different than if you took a round dial, cut it with the scissors, and then stretched that indicator out. It's still an analog presenter, uh, analog indicator. In this case, however, the pointer is this black box. That's the pointer. And instead of the pointer moving, the needle on the round dial moving, the scale is moving behind the pointer. So the movement portion happens on the scale, not the needle. We have a very precise digital value for airspeed. Here's a case where the digital information is good. Do I need to be best glide, whatever? By the way, VX and VY are enunciated on your airspeed indicator. You don't have that on a round dial. That's pretty handy. Yep. You have the white zone and the green zone, all those things. Uh, Bob's asking me about AOA. I'll come back to that. It's not active. Oh, sure, it's active. Okay. I think it's active in this moment. As I pitch up, Bob's asking me about this. This is our angle of attack indicator. As okay. I pitch up, okay. angle of attack increases, the green bars blank out. As I lower the nose, then they come back on. Okay. If, if I were to fly to the point of um, reaching the yellow zone, one of the nicest things about the angle of attack indicator is the audible alert. As I get to the yellow zone, you would in the headset you would hear a tone beep, beep, beep. And then the higher the angle of attack goes, you get an analog presentation. It starts to beep faster and faster like a Geiger counter. That's that's one of the analog features in here I think might save your life one day. That? Oh, yeah. Behind the angle of the tech, the AOA oh, that is a cardinal heading indication on the horizon. You're, get, you're getting me all out of sequence here, but that's okay. There's south, 180 degrees. Okay, so anyhow, angle of attack, that audible alert, it's very relevant. I used to fantasize about having an airspeed indicator in my mall, and I said, well, well I'd like it to give me a tone as I get close to the bottom of the white arc. Right, because the airspeed, when I'm flying in the bush, that's the last thing I'm looking inside the cockpit for is to verify my airspeed. So I say, well, what if I had a tone that came on when I was within five knots at the bottom of the white arc? That'd be cool. Well, when is the bottom of the white arc relevant for me in that context? In one condition only. G loading of how much? 1.0 G in the dirty configuration, right? If any of those parameters are changing, so if I'm using it in a tight turn to final in a bush strip, am I at 1G? Nope. All, so that analog indicator I was relying on is almost useless now, right? Angle of attack 
is regardless of G loading, wing loading, speed, it's a fixed. So pretty cool. And it does rely on installing our, our own pitot tube, the uh, AO8 pitot tube, because it has a special shaped nose and so on. Okay, airspeed, we covered that. What are these values down here? True airspeed, airspeed and ground speed. Ground speed. Yep. Hey, Kirk, going back to the sure. AOA, uh, is that all that's required? Yep, you require our pitot tube. It actually has two lines, a primary pitot and a second line. We call it AOA, but it's in, a, in this essence, it's a secondary pitot. It's on a beveled face on the nose of the pitot tube. The primary opening is relatively insensitive to the angle of the relative wind. The, the smaller port on the beveled face is highly sensitive to that angle. So we're sensing the difference in pressures that are, that's experienced by those two pitot ports. And you, you calibrate it in flight in your own airplane. So even if you mounted it on one wing and that wing had a whole bunch more washout than the other wing, for example, there'd be other indications. But nonetheless, that difference would be captured in your actual in-flight calibration of the, of the AOA. Ground speed, true airspeed. I find that I rarely look at this, but I myself got caught in a circumstance at Painfield at night when I sure as heck should have. And by the way, what's this down here? The wind's aloft vector, the direction from which it's coming, then the, um, the direction in degrees, it should say three, four, zero degrees at 12 knots or whatever. And then the bottom is the crosswind component. You don't have to pull out your E6B anymore to figure out crosswind, it's right there. So in my example, I was coming back to Payne Field, the tower closes at nine o'clock. It was after dark, I was coming from Arlington. I, I'd been doing touch and goes to the north at Arlington, so I was setting myself up to, for a downwind and, and landing to the north. Somebody else in the pattern said, hey, Painfield Unicom, I'm landing 1-6. Great, so I, okay, I'll follow him in. As I'm short final, it just feels like things are going by really fast. The lights and the runway lights and the markers, it's all going by really fast, but geez, I'm almost down then, so I just continue my landing. If I had looked at this or my ground speed, don't you think I'd have an indication that I was landing with a tailwind? So, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to say as much as I teach this, even I forget to look at some of these features. It hasn't happened since, and I hope it won't happen again, so you do have to orient yourself to use this information. You really have to, to, to work at it. What do we got over here? You just got a dancing arrow coming from the right to the left. What? There's traffic. That's a traffic indicator. It was a, an open diamond, I think you're referring to. Like an up arrow. No, it was actually a full diamond. Okay, what's this device over here? This is our altimeter. Yes? Same thing as the airspeed tape, the scale slides beneath, there's a traffic symbol for you. The white diamond says he's not a factor, he's not a threat, a collision threat, but you should be aware of him. By the way, he's climbing. Uh, if I were to show you the map real quick, you could see him portrayed on the map. Where is he? Maybe not, did he disappear? Why isn't he showing on the map? Oh, there he is out there. See? If I change my zoom level. Okay, so back off with the map. So altimeter, it's just like the airspeed tape, the scale slides underneath. There's your pointer. This magenta line, what is that? That's a trend indicator. It tells me where my altitude is gonna be in six seconds. If nothing else changes, that's where my air, uh, altitude would be. What's this value here? Decision altitude. It's not decision altitude? You're the IFR pilot, how come? Well, you're right. I'm, I'm trying to trick you. I don't, don't want to put, well, I could put it in there, but it's changing all the time. That is. The fact that it's changing, that's a good indication it's not the decision altitude. You're right. The w reason I bring that one thing up, I, I worry about confusion of terms. Now, density altitude or decision altitude applies to a very specific type of approach. More commonly, we'd expect it to be decision height or MDA. Nonetheless, 
when I'm worried about one of those decision altitudes, it's usually below me. And when I'm worried about density altitude, it's usually a high number, right? So personally, I would like to see density altitude at the top. Uh, the engineers tell me there's all kinds of technical reasons they can't do that, but I think it's just because they think my ideas are silly. But just something to be aware of, so that's density altitude. Now, what's this scale? You know this, right? That's your vertical speed scale, and notice something different. The pointer on the vertical speed scale is what moves, not the scale itself. The reason that scale behaves differently than these two is that that's a finite scale. You find the maximum vertical speed portrayed for your airplane, either 100 feet, or 1,000 feet maximum, 2,000 foot maximum, what you see here, or a 4,000 foot scale. But whatever scale you choose, it's a finite scale. So we move the pointer up and down. Now, by the way, if we change the screen layout and make the PFD narrow enough, there's no longer enough room in the pointer to put the digital value, so we put it in a smaller box up here. So you see that change depending on the screen layout. But for now, we'll leave it like that. So there's my vertical speed. I said this was a six second trend indicator. How many second indicator is this one? The vertical speed. What is VSI? What unit is it? Feet per minute. V vertical speed indicator is this many feet per minute. This is a six second trend indicator, so this is feet per six seconds. If you did the math, you'd find the mathematical relationship, but that explains why those two things track together, right? Because they're both trend instruments on, on the same mathematical factors. By the way, there's also a trend indicator on the airspeed indicator over here. Your airspeed in six seconds if you don't change anything. Okay, now what is this line all the way across here? Okay, I love it when you guys say that. So the white line all the way across there is the horizon line. So now we've got to come up with a new word for this. What's this border here between the earth and sky? You already used up horizon, so Rain. what? what? Rain. Now that's kind of a trick question. When, if we didn't have synthetic terrain showing and turn it off, now we just have one line, and we think of that as our horizon line. But when we add synthetic train on there, we bring into, another, into play another concept. The horizon is, by definition, the boundary at which the Earth and sky meet visually. So this is renamed the zero pitch line. More accurately, what that means is anything portrayed on the PFD that's at that line is at your same altitude. When you're on the ground, those lines are nearly the same, but the higher you climb because of the curvature of the earth, you can see farther. So the, the higher you climb, the farther the separation between those. But if I had traffic and he's at this line, he's at my altitude. Or if I have terrain ahead of me, that's where I'm gonna intersect the terrain. The white line, not where the earth and sky is. Does that make sense? Okay, what's next? The pitch lines, these tick marks. Oh, the yellow marks here. We, for some reason, I have not yet figured out, we call that waterline symbology. But it's the same thing as the little airplane symbol on your attitude indicator. You remember, you got every time you sit in, you adjust the seat height, and then you run the little airplane up and down. That's him. That's the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. These are anal analogous to the wingtips. And the yellow mark up there is the vertical axis of the airplane. So then these are pitch reference lines. There's two and a half degrees nose up, five degrees nose up. There's seven and a half and 10. At 10 degrees, there's a line that runs all the way across. Same thing down here. At 10 degrees down, there's a line that runs all the way across the, the horizon. Uh, we talked about this zero pitch line and the horizon. Now I'm gonna do something, hopefully you don't normally do this, but I'm gonna pitch us up quite a bit. So I'm building up some airspeed. Now we're going to pitch up abruptly. I paused it. So here we are. We're in a zoom up climb. 20 degrees, 21 degrees, nose up. So this, 
the attitude indicator is drifting down. Notice what happened right here. The synthetic terrain is gone. We've got brown as the ground, blue as the sky. Here's my zero pitch line, and there's a dashed line here. So what, what's that about? Well, if I continue the zoom, it'll become more apparent. When you're in an extreme attitude, pitch attitude, we can't show you the synthetic terrain because it's really down here someplace. But we, we want to give you a visual reference of where the ground is. So we never get rid of the brown completely. We change this to a dashed line to say that's not the real zero pitch line. He's out of you down here. But it's not a bad idea for you to push the nose that direction, right? So that's, that's what that dashed line presentation means. If I have enough energy left to complete the zoom, ah, the big red arrow is an even better indication. Yeah, maybe you want to go the other way, right? Now, I've had some aerobatic pilots say that the, those, those symbols aren't presented in the right way for them. I would submit that most of you are not going to be flying aerobatics with reference to your EFIS instruments, right, in that regard. So. So that's what that's about. Now let's talk about the bank angle. So here's your bank angle arc, and we, there's my vertical axis indicator is the yellow triangle. So as I bank the airplane, there's 10 degrees, 20. The big tick mark would be 30 degrees. The white triangle is 45 and 60 clear out here. I probably should put some nose up, shouldn't I? So that's pretty, that's, you understand what you're seeing there, don't you? So what are the blue triangles? Standard rate rate one turn. Well, it's related to standard rate, but that's not a rate instrument. Here's your standard rate indicator. Your rate of turn indicator is this magenta bar. And that line there would be standard rate, half standard rate. So that's a rate instrument. The blue triangles are related, but before I explain them, let me back up and talk about this trend instrument, the vertical speed indicator. You remember, think back when you were learning to fly, so you got the airplane straight and level, and your flight instructor said, hey, I want you to pitch, pull the nose up a little bit, give me a 400 foot per minute climb, okay? So what do you do? You, you pull the nose a little bit, and you say, oh wait, that's too much, how do you know? Well, look at the vertical speed indicator, it's up at 1,000 feet now, push the nose down, okay, I'll push it down there. No, that's too much, where's it going? Oh, now you're down to, what you're doing here is you're putting in a control input and then you're referring to a trend instrument for feedback. And by definition, a trend instrument, there's some built-in lag. And so we're, we're dealing with what's called a feedback loop. What's the most notorious feedback loop you typically see in the pitch axis? Sorry. Pilot induced op oscillation, right? It's just an inherent nature of a feedback loop. The longer the feedback time, the more the oscillation is likely. So when I was taught IFR flying, I was taught, okay, when I, if, you wanna, if you want a 400 foot per minute climb, you add two inches of manifold pressure with a control device, you pitch the, the nose up to the whatever, two and a half degree mark, which is another control instrument, and the trend instrument will give you the necessary performance. It will confirm your control instruments, right? So the rate of turn, here's your trend instrument. This is a, con a control or a performance instrument that you've never had before. If I want a standard rate turn, I put it on the blue triangle. I'm gonna pause there. Yeah, so if I'm on the triangle, I've got a standard rate turn. So the first, for the first time ever, you don't have to rely on that feedback loop and roll. If you're flying IFR, you fly to the blue triangle, there's your standard rate turn. It, it not only gives you more precise control, but it, again, it simplifies your instrument scan for IFR flying. By the way, what happens to those blue triangles as you change your airspeed? Where do they go? If, I, if my airspeed increases, where do those triangles go? Well, when you go faster, does it take more bank or less bank for standard rank? So, right, as your airspeed increases, we dynamically reposition those blue triangles. And as you go slower, those triangles come in. It's all very cool stuff. All of these, and is that a digital indicator? No, that's an analog indicator, but allows me to do what? My, one of my favorite catchphrases, make a better decision sooner. 
and it's analog presentation. It's a digital computer, but we're presenting this information in analog format because you have inherently analog computers. <sighs> Boy, I'm off my slide. Did we cover all this? Bug values? Indicators? Ah, any military pilots in here? Did you ever fly with this device here? Do you know what that is? Yeah, that's where your airplane is. Oh. We, what did you call it? Do you remember? We didn't have it in our airplanes, but I found out since. We call it the flight path marker. When it was originally devised, it was before synthetic vision, it was called a flight path vector. It shows you your trajectory through space in relation to your attitude instrument. So this means my trajectory through space is above the above my horizon or above my zero pitch line, so I should be climbing. And by the way, it, my trajectory is slightly to the right of my nose and I'm coordinated, so I must have a crosswind from the left. This is my trajectory through space. Now when I add synthetic vision, when I do this, you're going to feel a snap inside your head. Kind of subtle, but it's there. Do you feel that mental shift? I, and I'm really serious about this. I'm not, this isn't a joke. Something clicks. This makes so much more sense of the, of the, uh, to your brain because you have a picture that you've grown up with your whole life, the analog world in front of you. And now this isn't just a trajectory through space. This is a trajectory away from or toward not space, right? I don't want to go here. I want to go up there. History is littered with the wreckage of airplanes that were trying, nose up, trying to climb over Mount Rainier or a ridge or whatever. And so here's my terrain. My nose is above the terrain, so I'm going to go over, right? Full power, vertical speed, positive. Am I going over that terrain? No. The flight path marker says that's where you're going, into that terrain. So do what? Make a better decision sooner. Add power, lean the engine, fly to another slope and catch some updraft. But how far away do you know? We, we digitally portray the terrain to the horizon. You know a long ways away that you're not going to get over that ridge. Something might change, winds might change, whatever. But if nothing changes, there's no reason to make, wait till the very last minute to turn away. That flight path marker tells you to turn away now. You're not going to make it unless something changes pretty big deal. It's a very big deal. Now, who said, Paul, I think, not to pick on you, but I think you said that synthetic vision is not very useful in Iowa. Well, I kind of said that kind of jokingly, but this is, if we disregard this up here, this is still pretty featureless terrain. Imagine that was Iowa and it truly was just a checkerboard. If I have standard instruments, what do you see up here that gives you any sense of motion? You got the DG spinning, and you have these cardinal headings sweeping by. That's kind of neat. But beyond that, it's symbology, and you have to be trained what the symbology means. But as soon as I add the synthetic vision back, even without any uh, terrain here, just the checkerboarding we do on the flat, indistinguished terrain supplements the peripheral data that you're brain is clamoring for. You know how the flight instructor says if you're having problems with your landing flares, focus on the end of the runway. It's not because he wants you to see the end of the runway. What he knows, he probably can't even articulate it in this way, but the root of this is that when the human, when the eyes are focused near, if I stare at you, at your shirt, that's all I see. My eyes are taking this in, but all I can see is your shirt. If I focus out there, I could tell you the proximate color of every shirt in the room because the brain processes peripheral data when your eyes are focused to infinity. When your eyes focus near term, it focuses the mental process as well. So when you look at the far end of the runway, he knows, the instructor knows that your mind is going to process your peripheral data that says how close are you to the runway. Same thing here. As soon as we populate all this checkerboarding of synthetic vision, it supplements all that peripheral data that you don't get. And I cannot overstate how critical that is. It's a big, big deal. And I'm one of the best 
clinical proofs of that because I've had a lifelong problem with motion sickness. And this vastly reduces my susceptibility to motion sickness and by extension spatial disorientation in IMC. Because in essence, I'm never in IMC in the sense, uh, I have another phrase, it's always a sunny day in Skyview. Now, it doesn't mean you should go flying around in the clouds, in mountains when you're not trained to do it or not proficient or not current. Nonetheless, if I've made a series of bad decisions, got caught out by weather, even if I'm not IFR current, I believe I can land safely if I had to. I'm going to say those magic words, I declare an emergency, but I think I'm going to make it. You can back the, the crash truck off another hundred yards because I wouldn't want to hit him. Right? When you fly, you usually keep a synthetic vision up. Do you keep it on the wide mode? You know, I, I think Paul asked me that earlier. I haven't flown enough with, it, with this feature in place. It's a fairly new feature for us within the last two or three months. So I haven't uh, got much experience flying with the wide versus narrow mode. I, I don't have an opinion. So I don't know. You'll have to try it out and see. Okay. No, is there anything else up here we haven't covered? Uh, we talked about the various bugs. Notice that the, all the bugs themselves and their digital values are in this blue color. Those are indications that those are values you can change through the user controls, not by piloting the airplane. There's a knob or something that can change that value. Here we have outside air temperature. Uh, slip skid ball at the top. I didn't talk about him, but I think you know what that does. This is a bug called course. It's only relevant if your navigation source is a VOR or, or an IL, or localizer. So we'll, we'll see that later, I think. Okay, I think I've got everything up there. Let's put the map on the page, Paul, or uh, Bob. Maps on the page. Where do I want to go? Well, let's, uh, let's go to this airport up here. 00WA. Well, one way to do it would be to simply change the heading bug, right? And I could sweep across him. So I'm looking at the map and I'm orienting the bug across there. And there's my bug. If I turn to that bug, there's a good chance it'd point me towards that airport, right? What if I wanted to go direct to him? Well, when, when, we, when we press the direct to function on the map, we don't know for sure what's going to come up. Because there's, again, this complex logic of what's, gonna, what's it going to point to first. I could use the nearest list, but what's my nearest airport going to be? Seattle, right? Because that's where I'm at on the map. There's one feature I didn't show you related to that. And that is when I'm panning, actually let me use the, the knob like the rest of you would. If I pan my cursor into the vicinity of that airport, then watch what happens when Bob presses the nearest list. Anytime you're in the panning mode, the nearest list becomes reference to the cursor, not your own location. So the quickest way to go there is to pan the cursor there, press nearest, he's highlighted, and then press the direct to button. Okay, now exit from the panning mode, however you do that, and there's my direct to course line. Make sense? Okay, no, that's not new. That's, that's been there. Okay, well then you earned your money. You got your money's worth already again. You're going to owe me money by the time the day is done. Whole bunch of traffic going on around here. How am I doing on time? Two, three, I got it. An hour and a half. Okay, another teachable moment. Bear with me. I never know when I'm going to cover this topic, but this is a perfect time. I have to beat it into pilots all the time. Look out the airplane. This equipment is seductive, but most of you are flying a VFR airplane. You got to look outside, right? You got to. You just have to. So we're doing flight training up at Skagit Bayview, doing pattern work. There's people out in the tulip fields looking at the tulips, and bless my heart, bless his heart, my the guy I'm training is looking out the window, and I'm you know so I get the luxury of looking at the maps and stuff. So on one turn to crosswind, we're climbing out, turn crosswind, all of a sudden traffic alert, traffic alert. And so he's looking out and he's continuing to turn. So what did I do? Well, he's looking out, so good for him. I looked at the map and the first thing I did was change my zoom level to three nautical miles. And because why? 
Because I know if it's not within three nautical miles, I'm not going to see him. If I look out the window, I'm just flat not going to see him. Maybe it's because I got old eyes or I got a poor skin. I'm not going to see him. But, now this guy's just barely within three miles, but what I do know is there's his vector arrow, and where do I want to be? Not there. Right? So in the span of three seconds, I looked in, changed the scale of the map, looked for traffic in here, looked for vector arrows, and made a decision to go away from the vector arrows. Then I look back at him. Hey, Mike, what are you doing? Well, I'm still looking. To, I'm trying to find that guy. Uh, then I have the airplane. Where am I going? Not there. Now, as soon as I'm turned away from that known hazard, based on the best information available, now I got to go back to scanning outside the window in case there's some no radio traffic. The point is, you constantly have to work to not get seduced eyes inside the cockpit. However, when something changes, when there's a critical situation, this information may give you the ability to glean more useful information in less time and do what? Make a better decision sooner. So traffic alert, I heard it in my ear, it's on my primary flight display. Look at the map, change the scale, make a decision and get the heck out of there, then go back to looking outside. And again, that's a one minute line on the That's a one minute trend vector. Okay. So in this case, I'm gonna turn left. And your one minute line is on your... Yeah, my one minute line is here. Yeah. So in one minute, we should still be far apart, but I'm a much more conservative pilot than that. Yeah. I'm still gonna turn away, yeah. right? Right, maybe. But he's 39. Yep, well, so not all the factors are the same. The point is, he was doing what I taught him, looking outside. He hadn't yet embraced the idea that a quick glance in the cockpit can give me so much more situational awareness in such a short time, right? So that's, a, that's an important lesson to, to internalize from this stuff. Okay, so now we have our direct two line and we're ready to navigate and we could just hand fly to that. We talked about using the lubber line. There's my projected ground track. Even if I didn't have that course line, let's say I wanted to fly to this airport, W37. How can I do that? Well, I, without even changing the lubber line, if I keep my aircraft in control but I stop my turn with this ground track line sweeping over that airport, that's where I'm going, right? Or if I'm trying to circumvent airspace so I don't have to call in and ask for permission to go through your airspace because we're all scared to talk to the controllers because we don't do it regularly. So I want to stay out of your airspace. Keep your ground track line from going into that airspace. It's as simple as that. Okay, now, how are we doing? Are you okay or do we need a break or can I go, go right into the autopilot? Forge ahead, okay.